Welcome everyone to the Autism Now What podcast. Today we are speaking to Dr. Jodi Dashel. She is an internationally recognized pioneering clinician in autism spectrum disorders, mold, biotoxin illness, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, and Lyme disease. As a member of the International Lyme and Association Diseases Society and a Lyme literate naturopathic clinician since 2010, Dr. Dashel has an amazing track record using all natural protocols for helping patients with chronic and resistant Lyme disease. Dr. Dashel received her PhD in integrative medicine with her thesis focus on medical herbalism for autism spectrum disorders. She also holds a doctorate in OT specializing in neurology with her thesis focus on traumatic brain injury and stroke. She additionally holds a postdoctoral specialization in advanced neurosensory integration. She is also a registered herbalist with the American Herbalist Guild. Her speciality covers a wide range of illness, including autism, PANDAS, PANS, mast cell activation syndrome, food allergies, and much more. Wow, this is incredible. Dr. Dashel is also the author of the Bionexus approach to biotoxin illness a step-by-step guide to sustainable plant-based treatment options. The book is her last work. It's a must read. It shares part of the journey she took to recover her son, Brian, and shows how she treats mold and biotoxin illness at her clinic, Bionexus Health in the United States. Her book is written as a guide to practitioners, but also serves as a reference for parents and adults seeking answers who or who want a more natural treatment approach. Dr. Dashel is the founder and director of Bionexus Health Clinic. As a master herbalist, she has created an exclusive line of herbal formulas Bionexus Herbals, now available to practitioners worldwide. She has helped patients from over 50 countries around the world and treats patients of all ages using plant-based medicine and all natural protocols. Dr. Dashel, wow, wow, wow is all I can say. It is such an honor and a privilege to be speaking to you today. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Ilana. I must say the work that you do in in South Africa is is absolutely amazing in itself. Thank you. I am so passionate, as I know you are, to get the word out there that Mm -hmm. parents can have treatment options to treating their child with autism. And I'm so excited to be hearing the information you're going to be sharing with us today because many of our South African parents get told that autism is the end of the road. Take your child home, make him comfortable, goodbye and good luck. And it's going to be wonderful hearing what you have to say about that diagnosis today. So let me jump into the questions I've prepared. Tell us about your son, Brian, and his journey with autism. Yes, of course. Um, I'll try and be brief. Um, You know, it's important to look at these different aspects that I'm going to speak of. Uh, My pregnancy was complicated with tremendous trauma from a sudden death of a sibling and the events of uh, 9-11. So I'm grateful for my husband's survival, but he worked in the South Tower of the World Trade Center on the 42nd floor, and it was... uh, 10 plus hours before he was found, injured but alive and uh, sent home while I was uh, seven, seven and a half months pregnant at that point. Um, Additionally, in hindsight, my son was also born with uh, gestational Lyme. So along with 
you know, all of the stress hormones and toxins from, from the 9-11 uh, event, uh, we were also dealing with the gestational Lyme disease, as I found out later. Uh, a vaccine injury happened at about 18 months was the last straw that broke the camel's back for him and he stopped progressing, fell into what appeared to be autism spectrum disorder. However, you know, uh, there were many diagnostic discrepancies that I questioned the diagnosis right from the start. Mother's intuition is, is a huge deal for me. Uh, biomedical treatments made very little difference his condition got worse actually until one day at about six and a half years of age, he suddenly lost the leg uh, use of his left leg. Uh, he developed excruciating pain in his pelvis. He ended up in a wheelchair. From genetic experts to cancer specialists, we saw 19 to 20 physicians and all had no answers. We finally explored PAMS, PANDAS, Lyme, we found out that he had 11 co-infections, biotoxin illness. Biotoxin illness is also known as SIRS, which is Chronic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, CIRS. Uh, Brian also experienced lack of growth, failure to thrive, uh, lots of hormonal issues, early puberty, then flattened puberty, late puberty. It, it, was, it was a mess. Um, as we progressed with treatment, the recovery was pretty sawtooth, but you know, overall we saw that it was trending upwards. We saw astonishing cognitive gains, full recovery from autism. We recovered from PANS, uh, tick-borne infections, the CIRS, uh, the herbal protocols that I had created for my son were so effective that I decided to make those available uh, to my patients and uh, many practitioners who requested the same. As you know, kids on the spectrum, you know, whether accurately diagnosed or misdiagnosed, but kids on the spectrum have um, a lot of immune and gut issues. That's why in the beginning, when, when we had to use pharmaceuticals because we were trying to save his life, get him out of uh, the wheelchair, stop the pain, uh, we had to use pharmaceuticals. We didn't really have a choice, but sooner, uh, but soon enough, you know, within six months, we found uh, tremendous problems with the gut. So I had to uh, study and learn with many, uh, many master herbalists how to transition smoothly to an herbal protocol. And eventually I, I uh, found out that I had to create um, blends and formulas that were not available in the market at that time. So that's how, you know, um, BioNexus was born. And Ilana, as you know, my son is now in uh, medical school, hopes to earn his specialization in immunology and join BioNexus after his um, um, residency and fellowship. So I, I look forward to that day with uh, immense pride and gratitude. <laughs> I have goosebumps um, and I have tears in my eyes because firstly, it's a miracle that your husband survived the 9-11. Um, that's wonderful. And then what I loved about what you said, you said that I questioned the diagnosis right on the start. And most people do not. Most people accept the diagnosis, which is often given in my country, South Africa, and in many other countries as um, you know, the end of the road. So that was very, very nice for everyone to hear. And also you said that once you started treated, treating him with the herbs that were working, it was an upward trend. So I always try and remind parents that, you know, this is not something you're going to just swallow one pill and it's going to be a miraculous cure overnight. You really do need to have the patience. And then you said that he'd recovered fully from autism and that today he's in medical school, uh, even considering a speciality in immunology. I think that is so hopeful and so encouraging for the, all the parents listening today. And if you're a parent listening and you doubt it, that autism is treatable or recoverable, here is Dr. Dashall um, to prove that this is in fact possible. And I think we can learn so much from her about her herbal formulas that she put together that you then realize Dr. Dashell is not available on the market. Right. 
Okay. So here's a question for you. What motivates you to get out of bed every day? Gratitude for all the blessings and wanting to pay it forward. I am uh, very passionate about what I do. I love interacting with uh, all of my amazing patients and their families from so many different countries and cultures, um, meeting new families that I can try and help. I also, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit eccentric, a little weird. <laughs> I love to talk to my herbs, plants, my trees, uh, try new recipes um, every day, hopefully. Uh, nowadays, my immunology classes at Harvard are so captivating, I can't wait to learn more every day. You know, we have six to nine quizzes a week, Ilana, and I seem to look forward to that. <laughs> How weird is that? Um, I think I can relate. I think that you've been on such a long journey of healing your son. And I think it's beautiful that you're sharing it with so many families. Your work is just incredible. Um, why did you decide to establish Bionexus? I felt there was a need for a completely plan-based practice offering a unique 360 approach to help uh, parents and people going through what I went through, both myself and with my son. There really wasn't anyone you know, who was properly licensed, qualified, uh, Lyme literate through ILADS, autism expert, methylation expert, shoemaker certified, uh, SIRS practitioner, herbalist, all rolled into one, and who had also lived through it with their own child. So I thought all of the unique formulas and blends I created for my son, the decade long uh, clinical research, the experience gained, uh, both myself as well as mentoring with so many amazing practitioners that I had the good fortune uh, of mentoring with, I, I felt it would help uh, some people in the same boat. I, what I didn't expect was the blessings of being able to help thousands around the globe. So it's been marvelous and humbling experience and I'm grateful every day for it. I think we as parents are very lucky that there are doctors like you who think the way that you do. And what I love about what you said is that you follow a 360 approach. I'm gonna, I'm gonna remember that. And I hope the parents listening today remember that because many of the parents listening have been told that autism can't be a 360 and there isn't a 360 approach. So I really love that you mentioned that. Now, um, I've read that your treatment plans are individually built according to the patient's genetics. I've personally learned so much about genetics and I think, it took me a decade to truly understand that autism is epigenetic and how it actually unfolds. And I find myself explaining this to parents on a daily basis. And it's surprising to many people to hear it for the first time. But I read that you use the work um, by individualized uh, approach to every patient. And that's how you customize their particular program. So can you tell us more, more about this approach? Uh, yes. In complex autism, I, I like to call it complex autism when there are underlying medical issues. So in complex autism, there are many co-infections and other comorbid issues like biotoxin illness, innate immune system upregulation, adaptive immune system suppression, uh, there is often multi-organ system uh, pathology. Microbes tend to mutate in order to maximize their survival, reproduction, and to hide from the immune system. So even if two people on paper have, for example, mycoplasma, how that bacteria affects you and exists, exists within your body is unique to you as a person. In addition, with Lyme and mold issues, um, we are actually dealing with specific genetic HLA markers. To that, add uh, to that methylation cycle genetics can play a role, uh, especially the CBS C699, the VDR TAC, and the MTHFRs. 
Uh, in addition, one needs to factor in the immune and the mitochondrial dysfunction that, as you know, has been widely studied in autism. So in order for the best clinical outcomes, I find it's very important to tailor the protocol to the patient specifically. It's important to be sensitive to the hard earned financial resources and to use them wisely to see, you know, um, the biggest bang for your buck, so to speak. You said that the microbes tend to mutate and hide. I don't think I've solved that for David yet, um, but I think you've given us a really nice summary of how this bi-individualized approach works. There is a laboratory in South Africa where we can do a saliva test to actually get the reading on these um, genetics that you were talking about, like the MTHFR, the VDR, the HLA. Is there a specific laboratory that you use in America when uh, parents become your patient or can they test anywhere? No, it can be done from anywhere, yes. Um, uh, the uh, methylation cycle is pretty accurate and anywhere you get it done from. Is there a specific lab though in America that you prefer or? No, in, in the US there are uh, many labs, you know, and then there are also uh, a, a couple websites that run that if, if you're comfortable with that, no. Uh, there is no specific lab that I like to use. Okay, we, you just happened to mention the MTHFR um, and I know that parents that are recently um, just getting used to this autism diagnosis and they're hearing MTHFR and they're hearing methylation. What is this all about? What does it mean when we say that the, the child has a derailed methylation pathway? Uh, first of all, I would request anyone exploring methylation to take a step back because, you know, and, and get the full picture. Uh, don't get overexcited about methylation. Hey, you know, there's mutations. I found mutations. I need to do something about it. Uh, it's, it's important not to overmethylate. Uh, overmethylation does not look pleasant at all. So many are convinced just because you see a mutation in a lab test, you have it. Well, having it genetically and that particular mutation expressing itself are two very separate things. Yes, even when the lab test shows you are compound homozygous. And for both uh, the MTHFR C677 and the A1298. Now, an experienced and well rounded practitioner will be able to discern the difference between just having them on paper and the fact that these are actually expressing in your child. There are many clinical clues. In fact, when it comes to brain inflammation caused by uh, biotoxin illness, and even Lyme disease, I would say, messing with methylation early in the game can lead to increased inflammation along with uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms. With my son, you know, since methylation became the, the buzzword um, 12, 14 years ago, that uh, we started, you know, we were uh, advised by a really renowned practitioner to look into it and, and, you know, start doing something about it. And in fact, you know, we had quite the opposite reaction. And that's the reason why I started uh, exploring methylation. And, and you know, I, I wanted to become an expert in methylation as well. Uh, we, we ended up, you know, with my very, a uh, calm, quiet son becoming suicidal. And I found him, you know, we were just, uh, I, I, I was always making sure he's around, he's okay. So I'm, I called out one day, hey, Brian, where are you? And I didn't hear anything back. And then, you know, my instinct told me to just literally run upstairs to his room, right? He, he was usually downstairs and around me. And I'm like, where did he go? So I followed my instinct. I ran upstairs and I saw him, uh, standing near the window in his room and the window was open. Now we have a screen, right? We don't have a grill, we have a screen. So uh, at that time we had some language uh, had already come in when, when we had uh, started methylation. And uh, I have, I'm like, Brian, what are you doing? He looked very anxious. And, and you know, a couple of days back he was, he was fine. Um, 
So he said, mom, I'm glad you came because he was, uh, you know, he was thinking of jumping. Goodness. So I, I don't know what drove me to run upstairs. And so, I mean, I just grabbed him, hugged him, you know, in, in, in his little voice, uh, his, his, his voice hadn't normalized by then, you know, we got language, we got, I mean, he always had a few words, but he was never able to put anything into phrases. Um, you know, many of the words were pronounced wrong. Like for example, pizza, when he first started was tatiti. I knew what that meant, but, uh, I, and I know many other parents can go through that as well, you know. Um, so in, in his broken language, he told me about the anxiety. He said, uh, uh, brain uh, is, uh, I'll never forget, brain is shivering. And I, I immediately picked up, called the practitioner, of course, I, uh, you know, and then we had to stop the methylation, even though we were doing small doses. And uh, what made me realize that is I need to study this further. And whatever I just mentioned about methylation, that's the key. Just because you have it doesn't mean it's expressing. It, it has never expressed in my son. To date, it hasn't expressed in my son. You know, he, he has um, compound heterozygous, not homozygous. So maybe, you know, um, whatever the case may be, I like to look at children from a clinical perspective, not just a lab perspective. I think your message is so important today because I hear a lot of parents saying, I started folate or folinic acid and my child is now more hyperactive. And your message is that it's important not to over methylate and not to, um, consider treating this if it's not at the right time. Um, so that is really profound. That story is just profound. I think parents can hear that you speak from so much experience. Now, I meet many moms of autistic children on a daily basis who say, my child is a picky eater. I want to know what your thoughts on this are and why does diet play such an important role when it comes to autism treatment. I'll tell you, my son David was a very picky eater. It used to make my heart very, very sad. He was so sick when he was little uh, and he couldn't eat at all. There was a period of time where we only gave him liquid. When I speak to parents, the, I'll tell them about a diet and I'll mention food allergy. And parents are like, but can't I give my child soda? but he only eats cheese and noodles. How am I gonna do this? So can you tell us why diet is really important? I, I can talk about this for a while, but to keep it brief, you know, uh, the palate can be greatly influenced by any underlying medical issues. Often people with intestinal parasites and yeast issues tend to favor carbs and sugary things. Patients with adrenal fatigue will crave salt, Lyme disease affects cranial nerves and also the um, autonomic nervous system. Uh, cranial nerves like the, the trigeminal nerve, the facial nerve, the hypoglossal nerve that supply the face, the palate, the tongue. Also Lyme bacteria and Marcons, and I'll talk a little bit more about Marcons a uh, little bit later, have been isolated from the oral cavity. Pans, pandas, kids, having eating disorders during flare-ups is, um, is actually commonly known. And as you can see, it's important to think broad spectrum than just saying that, oh, you know, my child is a um, picky eater. I recall a three-year-old Ashley from Texas after four to six months on a very restrictive diet that I placed her on to avoid um, feeding the infections and she was also on the BioNexus protocol as well. About four to six months later, she actually started eating much better. Vegetables, fruits, savory foods, all the herbs were not an issue at all. Symptoms improved. The left side of her face, arm and leg, you know, which looked sort of semi-paralyzed, quite weak, they had started to develop tone and strength and coordination. Uh, she was able to climb the stairs without her left leg dragging and so on. So um, it is 
it is important to look um, deeper. You know, you, you have to dig deeper. You have to understand. In fact, I've, I've seen um, a couple clinical studies that, uh, 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 clinical animal studies that show that uh, lab animals, when they are injected with things like parasites and yeast, they tend to have um, a, a lot of psychiatric behavior as well as uh, what they will eat becomes uh, very specific. Like I mentioned, it's almost as if they're trying to feed their infections. I couldn't agree with you more. When I speak to parents, I'll say, what does your child love to eat? Because it's the very food that they tend to love that is that food that could be feeding the yeast um, or feeding the infections. Absolutely. Now, parents of children with autism are exhausted. When I meet the parents, I can just see that they haven't had a good night's sleep. How can we improve sleep? I know that you could do an entire hour presentation just on this, but just in a few points, how, what can parents consider when trying to improve sleep? Energy, sleep, right. Look for root causes. That is the, the biggest takeaway message. Um, mitochondrial hypometabolism, metabolic acidosis, melatonin deficiency, pineal gland suppression, endocrine imbalances. These are but a few of the physiological damage issues I find in my patients with complex autism. In any environmental illness like SIRS, biotoxin illness, the entire family is affected, right? Um, as is the case with, the, with families that are dealing with mold biotoxins. There are many endocrine disruptors in the environment that can deplete energy, slow down healing, affect sleep and growth, affect cognitive abilities, and so on. So long-term environmental exposure also leads to mast cell issues, multiple chemical and electromagnetic sensitivities. Um, now, this actually reminds me, you know, I, I, I like to give some uh, case studies, if I can, briefly. Uh, there, you know, I, I have a new patient, and uh, the child had just turned the corner, started focusing, you know, adding in some words, a lot of babbling, when suddenly there was a huge flare. And uh, mom and dad both panicked, called me, said, oh my God, he can't sleep. He's hyper, he's pacing, he's not eating, he's aggressive. He pulled out mom's hair to, to the extent that she had to uh, you know, completely chop her hair off and wear a cap so in, in order to avoid getting beaten up. <clears throat> so long story short was this poor child, uh, dad, had recently purchased a brand new Tesla car. And uh, this child, you know, Danny, I remember him. So Danny loved car rides that, that, that often lulled him to sleep, uh, as happens with, with, you know, many of our children, they, they, they kind of settle down in the car, you know, you, you just drive around for a bit. Now, that's what was happening. So when you have a brand new car, especially something like a Tesla, the electromagnetics and radio frequencies are immense in a car like that. Um, secondly, the new car smell is the VOCs, the outgassing. So this, this, you know, and when your body starts to recover, <coughs> mistakes like these can be very expensive. Expensive as in, you know, not just financially, but also emotionally, medically, uh, they can be, uh, you know, have a tremendous impact. Now, once we took that away, once we started addressing all of the toxins that he was exposed to, we addressed the EMFs, it took three months for things to go back to uh, trending upwards for this, uh, for Danny. So he's, he's doing much better now, you know, from every two week uh, brief appointments. Now we are back at the three to four month appointments is, is what I, I usually like to do for follow-ups. So Danny is finally stable now. 
That's an incredible story. And I think the message to the parents is that please check your environment to see what could be stressing that particular individual child. And they just are so very sensitive. Your story reminds me of a story I'd like to just share very quickly about my youngest son who did recover from, from autism. So Aaron is now nine years old. He's in a mainstream school. He's in grade three. And I remember when he was two years old, um, we went away for the weekend and I know to be careful about swimming pools because my oldest David has got autism. We, we were very careful with the pool because we could see that he, it would affect him. And um, after he would swim, he would get ticks. Now with Aaron, I was very careful and we weren't hundred percent at the time happy with his language. And, um, you know, we were away for the weekend and I thought, okay, you know, let him just get in the swimming pool once. And this was a public pool. From the next day after swimming in this public pool, there must've been an extreme amount of chemicals in the pool. He started drooling. And I remember becoming very worried because he, I could, he was swimming in the pool and then the very next morning we start seeing this drooling. I knew it wasn't his teeth. Do you know it? I didn't know Dr. Dashall then, um, but it took nine months, nine months to correct that drooling. My team that worked with him um, in the ABA program had t-shirts in the room he used to drill so much that the t-shirt used to be wet. They would have to go and change his shirt. And I knew that it was neurological. I knew that there was inflammation. And I feel so lucky that we were able to fix it, but it took a lot of time to correct, nine months. Now, now um, a lot of the kids, we see hand flapping toe walking, repetitive behaviors. Can you share your thoughts on reducing these behaviors? For those children with a possible false diagnosis of autism, these can all be symptoms of cranial nerve damage caused by Lyme co-infections, can also be multinuclear atrophy in the gray matter and swelling of the white matter that is caused in biotoxin illness. These are both very well researched and published uh, physiological damage phenomena. Uh, both Lyme and CIRS are uh, major triggers for PANS as well. That brings us to chronic inflammatory response syndrome. You call it CIRS. How does this play a role in contributing to the autism symptoms? Oh yes, that is a uh, very important and a uh, very good question, which needs to be explained well. So Dr. Shoemaker's body of work, now CIRS is the same as mold biotoxin illness in layman's terms. Now Dr. Shoemaker's body of work has been a game changer for us uh, and for many more, of course, around the world. Now, here's what we know so far. The body acquires biological toxins from various microbes, also from contaminated food, water, air, some insect bites as well. Now, your immune system, let's, let's talk briefly about the immune system, just to refresh. Uh, you have your innate or factory installed immune system and you have the adaptive or acquired immune system. Now, which would be, for example, when you get chicken pox, you don't get chicken pox again, that means you acquired that immunity or your body has you know, adapted to it. So that's the adaptive or the acquired immune system. Now, approximately 27% of the general population have a genetic HLA system, genetic predisposition through the HLA system, which can be tested, uh, where due to inherited immune response genes on chromosome number six, these genes that confer immunocompromise due to repeated long exposures and defective antigen presentation. This inherited faulty mechanism of the innate immune system uh, makes the innate immune system continue to be activated 
and generating inflammatory compounds like cytokines, it tends to be stuck on repeat, but the adaptive immune system never responds to clear out these toxins. Now, what happens is, you know, and, and I have to get a little bit uh, technical here because I know that uh, most autism parents, especially the mothers are <laughs> very uh, intensely involved in research and, um, you know, and, and, and I've learned so much over the years from, from these amazing moms as well. So it's important to talk about the, the science behind. Um, so what happens is the inflammatory response induces suppression of gene activity associated with lowered levels of a protein uh, that's called as CD3D, which is a critical encoded membrane protein that prevents an immune cell called as the antigen presenting cell from making a connection with a naive T cell of your adaptive immunity. Now, people will uh, know that T cells are very important for maintaining a healthy immune system, okay? Um, now, it is the T cell that tells the B cell to start making specific antibodies. And of course, I'm making this very simple. Now, if there is no interaction between the T and the B cells, there's no antibodies. No antibodies means immunocompromise. The complications of biotoxin illness is proliferative physiology, which includes metabolic acidosis, uh, pulmonary hypertension, T regulatory cell deficiency, insulin resistance, weight gain, neuronal injury in the brain, endocrine imbalances, um, delayed or early puberty, dysregulation of the immune system. You know, I, I have patients, uh, little girls who are seven years, six, seven years old, and, uh, you know, moms are horrified when they report that they actually think that they are beginning to develop already. Uh, I remember with my son, his voice changed. Uh, you know, he went from learning to speak, speech came in, his, his voice was still like, you know, Mickey Mousey, uh, the pans, pandas voice, uh, as it's known as. And then suddenly in fourth grade, it changed. So I mean, it's, he's in fourth grade. What is going on? So we had early puberty uh, when it wasn't supposed to happen. Then we had, uh, then we lost the entire growth cycle that happens during real puberty because some stuff happened early. So this was, you know, it, it becomes quite messy. Um, here I would like to mention most biotoxins are extremely small molecules. Biotoxins, they move from cell to cell through cell membranes without being carried in the bloodstream, which means they are difficult or impossible to find in standard blood tests. So um, as we know, Cellular ribosomal and mitochondrial injury is associated with metabolic hypometabolism. Okay, uh, there is aerobic glycolysis, the, the mechanism of aerobic glycolysis, which happens, which means that there is lowered cellular energy production for healing, for daily activities. You can have children who are wired and tired. You can have parents who are tired. Uh, and wired because they're all living in, in the same uh, environment. You know, you'll find it interesting and important to note, Ilana, that this uh, CD3D protein that I, I spoke about, the CD3D suppression, is also commonly seen in many chronic fatiguing illnesses like um, chronic fatigue syndrome, like fibromyalgia, and many mothers um, not so much fathers, many mothers that I, um, I uh, have in my practice have uh, issues like chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, they have uh, joint pain, they complain about um, thyroid problems and so on. So that is another clue that perhaps you may have a child that may have been you know, given a false diagnosis of autism. 
And we also know that mitochondrial and immune compromise are commonly seen and have been studied in autism. Over 90% of my patients with autism have PANS and SIRS is a huge trigger for PANS. The brain damage uh, that is associated with SIRS is uh, similar to the basal ganglia involvement seen in PANS pandas type issues. And Marcons, the sinus-based infections, um, they cause neuropeptide deficiencies created by biotoxin illness. And I'll, I'll talk about, uh, about Marcons in, in a little bit, but once Marcons is treated, usually significant cognitive and behavioral gains are seen um, in my patients. Wow. Sorry, very long. <laughs> There are so many things I want to say. I think I've heard a lot of parents mention to me that their child had early puberty. So I'm so happy that you're talking about that today because some of the parents listening can consult with you for it. In fact, there's a particular mom I'm thinking of now in Angola and her son um, is on the autism spectrum, but her daughter who actually doesn't have any um, diagnosis she recently felt that she was starting puberty very early and she was flying to South Africa to see me. And she asked me, you know, when I come to South Africa, is there a South African doctor you can recommend, you can help my daughter because she started puberty early. And I actually said to her, well, I don't recommend anyone here. So I'm so happy that I can now actually make the recommendation to you because I know she was very concerned about that. And another comment I would like to make is that you speak about the false diagnosis of autism. I'm so happy that you're mentioning this because the parents in South Africa who've been to the neurologist, the developmental specialist, the so-called experts in our country are told your child has autism, accept him the way he is. And if they are having certain behaviors, you can give them psychiatric medication. No one looks at diet, no one looks at mitochondria, no one considers co-infections. You said over 90% of children can have pans or pandas. I'm telling parents this on a daily basis. I'm not a doctor. So I'm very happy that they're hearing this from you today. And we'll speak about pans and pandas just a little bit later on, um, but yeah, this is, this information is really, truly wonderful. Now, um, we're now gonna talk about mold and I have done a lot of research where I was watching a lot of your presentations um, around mold. And it's so interesting to learn about how this can affect health um, and cause so much disease. I think I'm so surprised. Um, I've heard you say that patients who were exposed to mold years back can be exposed to a trigger later on that causes the mold to recirculate. The mycotoxin gets stuck in the bind and gets recirculated. What is a binder and how can this help treat mycotoxin? What is the role of toxicity in autism? I actually was thinking that my son David is having this problem and that that's causing, uh, contributing to his autism symptoms and he's 18 years old now. So when I watched your presentation on mold and on mycotoxin, and I heard you talking about binders and, you know, this, the mycotoxin being recirculated, I thought to myself, I have to ask you this because I think this is a problem for my own son. Mm, okay. Um, I explained the mechanism of SIRS in the last question, um, and now I can explain a little bit about the, the genetics. Now, the HLA genetic type, if you are in that category, the 27% that have this genetic problem, that your immune system <clears throat> It goes into CIRS when exposed to biotoxins, mold is one biotoxin. So yes, it's true. You can have been, uh, you could have been exposed to mold years ago and your body is dealing with these toxins. I mean, you know, for example, uh, with your son, when he was younger, he may have been exposed 
to mold and other toxins, uh, which, which are biological and neurological toxins, you know, uh, things like heavy metals, uh, vaccines, all of the um, disgusting stuff that is in the vaccine. Uh, additionally, in the environment, volatile organic compounds, new furniture, new car, the phthalates in cosmetics. So there is, you know, so many toxins we are all exposed to on a daily basis. A brand new body is able to deal with them for a little while until it can't anymore. That's why I mentioned, you know, when I was uh, uh, speaking about the, the straw that broke the camel's back uh, with respect to my son was the DTAP injury at uh, 18 months. But for many, that can be a re-exposure to mold. Um, and yes, biological toxins, mold toxins get stuck in the enterohepatic circulation and they keep getting recirculated until you actually introduce a binder that can pull, pull the toxins out. So uh, there are many binders that can be used and they have to be done sequentially. Like in the beginning, it's, it's fine to start with something simple uh, as bentonite clay or activated charcoal, but gradually as you start working with your practitioner, you will be, uh, you know, you will run some tests, you will ascertain exactly what kind of toxins are uh, that your child is dealing with and what to do about those. Um, I've used activated charcoal for my son before in the past, and I've definitely seen improvement, but I hear what you're saying, that there's a sequential way that you determine which binder is going to be best. That was very enlightening. So Dr. Dashiell, talk to us about the immune system. You touched on it earlier. Can foods like gluten affect immune response? I tell parents you have to take gluten out of the diet, and I see these very sad faces now on Zoom before we, we could actually see people in person with COVID. Everything's done on Zoom, but I can see very sad moms on the other side of the Zoom when I tell them they have to take gluten out of the diet. Tell us about that. Okay. Uh, gluten can activate the lectin pathway. And, uh, you know, when we are embarking on something as huge as trying to modulate, recover the brain and the immune system, uh, you have to keep the end goal in sight when it comes to uh, you know, things like uh, going on a specific diet. And uh, I've been on a modified specific carbohydrate diet for my son for what now? He's 18 now, so since he was two years old. So we haven't changed that. And that's how he was raised. And that's how he's been taught to cook. And he'll cook, he'll eat, you know, there's absolutely no desire for, you know, any kind of junk food, any kind of donuts or and, and anything. It's just there, there is no desire. And, and you know, he has, um, it's important for us to empower our kids as they start recovering, that, you know, to be self-confident, to stand up for themselves. And I don't know how it's in South Africa, but in the US, everybody has some sort of an allergy. So, you know, if, even if they don't understand this whole, you know, genetic issues, blah, blah, you can, you can certainly tell your friends that, hey, you know what, I have an allergy, so I'm not going to eat that. And this, the, this is what, you know, I, I need to do to take care of my health. And we haven't seen um, in, any social problems with that. You know, friendships are great online friendships, in in-person friendships. So it's very important, instead of becoming uh, depressed and overwhelmed, that you look at the end goal. So gluten can activate the lectin pathway, and that has been associated with increased inflammation, autoimmunity, mast cell activation as well. So it's important to be gluten-free in my practice, until all the underlying medical issues have been cleared, even if outwardly you're not seeing any issues. Coincidentally, um, Ilana, I have been requested to speak about the innate and adaptive immune mechanisms in autism. 
and the autism COVID clinical connections at the next autism one conference, which is to be held this fall. So, uh, you know, please do join me then, uh, as well as your uh, clients can as well. And I did explain uh, briefly the role of the innate and acquired immune system, and they can both be affected uh, with gluten. So it's important to make that sacrifice and um, actually, you know, uh, especially teenagers with Lyme and mold, they'll ask me, Dr. Deshaw, when can I go back to being a normal teenager again? I'm like, you, you can't, never. <laughs> Simple as that, you know, yeah, exactly. Before we embark on this, you know, very costly uh, and uh, you know, a journey that's going to require many shifts in your perspective, as well as in your lifestyle, let's just understand what it entails. And you know, if you if you're telling me when can I go back to eating pizza pasta all day, it's never. I've actually seen all the beautiful food that you make for your son. Um, even now that he's at university, I saw pictures that you shared one day. And oh. I used to do specific carbohydrate, David, uh, for my son, David. When he was five and six, we put him on the specific carbohydrate diet. And I have to just share this story. My youngest era, when he was um, in his ABA program, you know, we used to feed him very healthy and a snack could be um, celery or carrots. And he actually became afraid of sweets. And I remember that they had to include a desensitization program to sweets because he wouldn't touch it and he wouldn't eat it. And even today, like if he sees sweets, he moves away um, and he doesn't like it. And it's, it's so interesting. We did the desensitization program because we didn't want him to have social problems because at school, his friends were going to eat sweets. But he's nine years old today and he will not eat a sweet. Um, he prefers healthy snacks and it's just become a way of life. And um, I'm happy about it because it's so, so important for his life. Um, and I wish teachers at school would take more notice of this. They certainly don't in our country. Um, I think if we could really just focus on what's going in that lunch tin for the child at school, I wish the teachers would be looking as well. But I get horrified at what is um, distributed to children at schools for parties or for special days at school. Um, and then we, you know, then we're wondering why they can't focus and they can't pay attention. And parents will say, my child leaves in the morning, doesn't want to eat. They don't eat their snack at school. They come back at three o'clock. And then for the children who've got ADHD, they're putting them on specific medications, which take their appetite away. And when I hear this, I just get horrified because nobody's looking at nutrition or considering the role that could be playing in the child actually not being successful at school. Is, is that the case as well in America? Because it's happening so much in South Africa. Yes and no. That's why I said, you know, it's a, a very hard journey trying to recover your child. It's easier to just go in with the mainstream and say, hey, you know what, I'm, I mean, it's not easy. Uh, you know what I'm trying to say uh, uh, comparatively that, okay, this is the diagnosis, you know, it's a life sentence for my child and, and, and you know, there is support available and that's it. But when you are going against all of that and saying, hey, you know what? No, I think there's a mistake. You know, I don't have any family history of any neurological problems on both sides, uh, the dad side and the mom side. What is this? It's, it's, you know, I need to explore further and see if I can recover. There are many sacrifices, a lot of hard work that needs to be put in, uh, you know, like, like we mentioned earlier, a full 360 has to be looked at uh, here. Yes, unfortunately, the sad truth, the standard American diet uh, is, is very similar to what you're speaking of. However, the individualized education plans, uh, or in our case, we had the 504 a medical legal plan, which we had in place. And uh, 
that that really empowers the, the parents that are looking to make to avoid any kind of toxin exposure in school. You know, I had um, air purifiers in each and every classroom. Uh, Brian actually told his teacher that that you know, even though he he did really good. Um, with his test, you know, he doesn't want the lollipop. And she goes like, why? He goes, uh, please read the ingredients. You know, this is very toxic. It has artificial colors, corn syrup, blah, blah. So teacher was, was horrified. <laughs> she was mortified. So next day she went to a local organic market and she purchased a, a big jar of organic lollipops. So at least that was some change uh, and, you know, it, it benefited all the kids in the classroom. Uh, so that's what we do. Like we have, uh, I have air, even now at college, we have air purifiers, which, which have been written into the program. Uh, he's not allowed any food in school. You know, he takes his uh, uh, supplements. He takes his own snacks. The snack breaks are written in, you know, uh, he's allowed to go outside, take off the mask. The mask is happening now, but with my son, he was so severe in the beginning. I mean, I, I nearly lost him a couple times because we had really severe issues. He would have to wear a mask to school every single day for two years. Wow. So, you know, yeah, social isolation, wearing a mask. For us, it was it was normal when, uh, when COVID happened. So we had been there. That's very interesting, but I think you, you raise an important point, which is if you are going to put your child onto the road to healing, there are many sacrifices and there's hard work along the way. Now, does mold cause inflammation? I think you mentioned that it did. And how do you treat inflammation? Do you have a whole lot of herbs that you use um, depending on how the patient presents? Correct. Yes. It depends on what damage the inflammation is causing. Is it brain damage? Is it organ damage? Is it organ stress? Uh, is it pain? What is going on? Just inflammation is good, but we need to know what is the end product of that inflammation for that particular uh, patient. So the treatment I use, of course, is the step-by-step -step Bionexus plant-based approach. We use herbs, homotoxicology, as well as supplements. And it, it, it is um, highly customized to the patient. Now tell me, pans and pandas. I know that you could present on this topic for a full hour at least, but just very briefly, what is pans and what is pandas and how does this contribute to the autism diagnosis? Pandas is when only strep is the organism involved. So pandas, you know, is pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric uh, uh, disorder associated with strep. But research has, um, has progressed and we have seen it to be an issue with many organisms. Hence, it's been renamed as PANS, which is pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric syndromes. And uh, it's an autoimmune condition where your immune system erroneously sends friendly fire or anti-neuronal antibodies to certain areas in the brain thinking that you know, that's an infection. Uh, the anti-neuronal antibodies are seen directed against the basal ganglia in the brain causing a variety of symptoms like OCD, anxiety, separation anxiety, aggression, eating disorders like anorexia, much more. Mold exposure is also a major trigger for pants as is electromagnetics, uh, EMFs or uh, vaccines or um, glyphosate, Lyme disease. So it depends on what becomes the trigger for your child. But we can treat this? Absolutely, yes. Uh, you know, the uh, world of modern medicine tells you that autoimmunity can only be treated with steroids. Uh, PANS uh, can, can be treated with IVIG, but that is not necessarily true. There are plant-based alternatives. There are beautiful 
herbals that are, you know, that help with neuro issues, that help with neuropsych issues, that help with, you know, spiritual maturity of the brain as well. And once again, good practitioner, step by step, a lot of hard work. I'm very happy to hear that because in my older son, David, when we did discover pandas, we did treat with cortisone with a steroid and we did treat with RVIG. So I spent hours on an RV in hospital. And I think a lot of parents do get afraid to put their children onto a steroid. So I'm really learning from you today and very interested to hear um, that there are herbs that can treat this in a better way. And I also think it's important that you mention that over 90% of patients with autism can have pants or pandas. Yes, yes, absolutely. You know, um, many parents go for uh, these very expensive treatments. Everything is expensive with autism, but, you know, things like IVIG, I, I, I tried one IVIG and I was lucky because back in the day, uh, God bless Dr. Kovacevic, you know, he never put anyone on cyclical IVIGs. It was like, your son is so severe that, uh, you know, he's not growing, there's failure to thrive. Uh, you might want to try one. And it was really, really hard for us to fly all the way down to Chicago, stay in a hotel and, 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 and you know, get this done for, for my son. It was so traumatic. Uh, we saw nothing. We saw, you know, it stirred up the immune system. As you know, IVIG is, is a donation from approximately uh, 10,000 people. It's a blood product. It's not screened for tick-borne infections like Bartonella, Babesia that are bloodborne. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a mess. Uh, I found it to be a mess, very expensive mess. $22,000 later, uh, the so-called benefit was a little bit of calming down on borrowed immunity of his motor tics. But wouldn't you know it, two weeks later, he was exposed to another kid with strep and we were back to square one. So um, I, I found that there are specific protocols uh, with camel milk, with herbs and uh, essential oils, supplements, when used in combination with the immunoglobulins that are available, uh, not only in camel milk, but also in sheep colostrum, goat colostrum, A2 or Guernsey cow colostrum in some kids who are, you know, who don't have the, the, the frat issues, the folate receptor antibody issues. So there are so many other options that can be used. Uh, if you are being told you need to do IVIG, just take a step back and make sure that you've addressed everything, all of the underlying issues that we are speaking of today. Uh, steroid, you know, Dr. Shoemaker's research shows that steroids, unless it is a life or death issue, if you suspect mold exposure, steroids should never be used because it, it just makes things worse. The same goes for antifungals. You know, I know antifungals is a huge deal <clears throat> with our children, <clears throat> sorry, on the spectrum, but you know, there are natural options. Pharmaceuticals that belong to the azole class of antifungals, like itraconazole, ketoconazole, fluconazole, these can make uh, the issues associated with biotoxin illness much worse, like brain damage, the antibiotic resistance of the Marcons that colonize the, the sinuses. Tell us more about camel milk. In your experience, how can camel milk help alleviate the symptoms of autism? And how did you stumble on camel milk? Hmm. I, uh, you know, we had a bit of a, a, a Zoom issue with the previous uh, segment, the question. So I don't know if, yeah, so if uh, what I spoke about IVIG, immunoglobulins, camel milk was recorded, but uh, just to briefly to touch upon it, um, IVIG was minimally helpful. We tried it once, uh, we relapsed within um, a couple of weeks and the, the side effects were also severe. So we decided, you know, that really wasn't the path for my son. And uh, 
subsequently, I looked into, started looking into alternatives for IVIG and, you know, so what, what I found was uh, good immunoglobulins, fresh immunoglobulins versus uh, IVIG, which is, you know, a donation from 10,000 or so donors who are not screened for bloodborne pathogens, as far as I know. Uh, and, you know, so the option would be camel milk, which contains uh, a, a good amount of IgG, could also be colostrum. A fresh colostrum is better versus the capsules, but sometimes capsules work well as well, you know, depending on where you, uh, where you get them from. So colostrum from camel, from sheep, from goat, and from some, for some kids who are uh, not FRAT positive, you know, they don't have the folate receptor antibody issue, uh, the Guernsey A2, A2 uh, milk colostrum can also work well, right? Either freeze dried capsules or fresh. Fresh is better. We are lucky to have, you know, uh, where my my farm is uh, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, it's, it's a, farm country, we have lots of organic farms. Uh, my, my herb farm is, is in a biodynamic, not just herbs, we also grow other things. But uh, so we are fortunate to get fresh stuff here, including fresh camel milk as well. So that's where my uh, camel milk happened and, um, you know, came into my radar. And it's critical to understand the immune system effects of camel milk and also important to introduce it at the right time. For me, I was given absolutely inaccurate information for Brian. So we ended up with a whole year of severe herxing, motor takes, IBS, and SIBO. Um, I, I, mountain I Ed, yes. um, you were talking about the RVIG. So as you know, I live in South Africa and when in the early years when I was seeking help for David, who's now 18 with autism, my doctor in America at the time did also prescribe the RVIG, which we were talking about under the pans and pandas. And I'll never forget the one round of RVIG. Um, we were doing the infusion and David actually became stiff. He couldn't walk and he developed a very high fever. Now, I had to always ask doctors in South Africa to do me a favor to um, help me implement the treatments that my doctors in America were recommending. And I'll never forget what a France I got that day. So I have also actually personally had a bad experience with the IVIG and unfortunately the IVIG didn't help David enough. Um, we have done colostrum over the years, but I don't think I've used the right one. And I'm very interested in hearing about the fact that you say that you can actually get colostrum in capsules um, and that there's different kinds that you can get it from goats or sheep or bovines. So there really is a wide variety. Yes, yes, certainly, yes. It's, it's important to uh, understand that there is no magic bullet. It is all needs to be done at the right time. Now with, you know, coming back to camel milk, I mean, Mom to mom support is great, you know, online forums, etc. But uh, you know, it's the autism spec spectrum, isn't it? And it's important to customize treatments for for each child based on where he or she is on that spectrum and what else is going on. Like too early uh, with camel milk, you may see some improvements, but without foundation work, it's like force feeding antibodies to a child with autism where immune dysfunction is already scientifically established. Now, long-term effects of this can be an explosion of autoimmune conditions in children who were fed camel milk, especially raw camel milk, without any medical guidance. Mm -hmm. You know, now uh, people will tell me, well, it's just food, you know, it's a, it's a superfood. Well, so is gluten, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Just food. Mm -hmm. But we know that for some people, how damaging it can be to the immune system, the gut, the brain, like with mold exposure on top of everything else, there can be mast cell activation, multiple chemical sensitivities, where the most innocuous of foods, 
sends the immune system into churning up uh, inflammation, inflammatory cytokines. So bottom line is there really are no shortcuts. It's not camel milk, it's not stem cells, it's not chelation. These are all great options, but all underlying medical issues need to be ruled out, treated if any, and then you know you might want to explore uh, these other extreme options if you can afford them. I think it's so interesting what you've said today um, because so many parents are looking for that one magic bullet. They the stem cells, the chelation. I hear a lot of parents saying, "Well, have you done chelation? Do you think they'll get my child to speak?" Parents are looking for that magic bullet, and as you say, every child is slightly different. What I've learned from you today is that timing is very, very important. I think it's the fine tuning of every child, the different causes for every child, and really just knowing how to systematically restore that child's health and eliminate what's causing the autism symptoms for that specific child. It's really a complex situation and it requires somebody who's very, very experienced um, to be treating children on the spectrum. Now, anxiety is something that a lot of parents raise and a lot of parents feel very sad about how anxious their child can become. Um, what are your thoughts around anxiety and autism? Yes, indeed. Uh, anxiety is a major symptom of PANS as well, you know, separation anxiety. And um, it is... Marcons. Now, th this brings me to Marcons. Marcons is multiple antibiotic resistant coagulase negative staph, staph bacteria uh, that colonize the sinuses of many children on the spectrum due to immune issues, hormonal imbalances, which, as we know, is quite commonly seen. Marcons will release two major toxins, exotoxin A and B, that cross the blood-brain barrier, causing inflammation and damage in the brain, and symptoms such as anxiety, headaches, sleep issues uh, happen. Head banging, it's very interesting to note that head banging often disappears after treatment of Marcon's, not in everyone, but you know, often I've seen that, as well as bedwetting, sleep issues, anxiety, these seem to resolve. Um, now, Bionexus Formula 1 NSB nasal spray is all herbal and is uh, clinically as well as lab researched that it is 97.4 to 99.3, I think, 99.2% effective against Marcon's, candida, mold, and, and biofilm in the sinuses. Um, I'm actually working on the legal paperwork, the permits, et cetera, that's required to make this, and a few other key herbal formulas, which many patients have been requesting, available to the general public. Um, I'll keep you posted, but for now, uh, as you know, Bionexus formulas are available uh, <laughs> only to practitioners, you know, simply because they are so effective and powerful the way they are made in small batch. I look forward to these nose sprays and to the products that you're formulating. So please do keep me updated. And in fact, we do have a doctor in South Africa that a couple of our parents here do consult. So I think it's gonna be very nice for him to know that he can actually access your Bionexus products. That's gonna be very helpful to parents as well. Um, now, can we touch on the link between Lyme and autism? You spoke about one of the triggers for your son being ge gestational Lyme. Um, what is Lyme and how does this play a role in autism? Uh, borreliosis or Lyme disease and uh, co-infections quite possibly. There just isn't enough research, but there's plenty of anecdotal evidence that uh, other infections can be sexually transmitted and can also be transmitted in utero from mother to child. I do see quite a few of both. A pregnancy that is carried to a full term in a water damaged building and the resultant effects on the child 
is something that I've been monitoring in my practice for the last two to three years as well. So that's another aspect, you know, because uh, Ilana, I, I don't know what your experience was, but my experience when my son was diagnosed on the spectrum was incredibly traumatic, beyond traumatic. You know, uh, people don't realize that the mothers blame themselves already. It's just that everybody, friends, family, you know, they, they start assigning blame. What did you do? What went wrong? Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's very traumatic from what I've seen, especially on the mothers. And I don't want to get emotional, but this was, you know, I, I was like, you know what, I'm going to trust my intuition. And my mom, um, God bless her. She was always firmly with me. She is, you know, um, comes from a very holistic, natural, uh, Greek Irish heritage. And she, we were raised naturally. Uh, she imbibed Ayurvedic into her, you know, because she married into an, an uh, Indian household and she imbibed Ayurvedic, she, she, uh, Ayurvedic remedies on a daily basis. So we were raised very holistically, all home cooked meals. Um, maybe two to three vaccines back in the day. So I, I was positive there was something else that was wrong with my son. I had this very strong intuition and, you know, I lost family, I lost friends. Um, there was tremendous upheaval at home as well. But in the end, look where we are today. So it wasn't easy. And um, it's important to understand why these autistic-like symptoms are happening. Uh, in some instances, it's a double whammy, right? A mother with Lyme disease, pregnant in a water damaged building. So these moms are usually unaware of their Lyme disease or biotoxin illness with sort of, you know, unrelated symptoms like allergic rhinitis, uh, Hashimoto's, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, PCOS, some, um, some other kind of, you know, bladder issues, ovarian issues, hormonal dysregulation. And because our society, our medical system labels all of these issues separately, it's difficult for the lay person to make that connection. So the newborns uh, demonstrate classic symptoms of multi-organ inflammation, like could be jaundice, pallor, uh, strong colic, sleep disorders, gut issues, sleep apnea, cardiac rhythm abnormalities. And believe it or not, we uh, other than jaundice, we I had all of these with Brian. Who knew? And afterwards, when I mentored with Dr. Charles Ray Jones, um, he sponsored me for ILADS membership and I mentored with him. I mentored with Dr. Jemsek uh, as well. Absolute Lyme legends that I learned about uh, what is Lyme induced autism. And it just blew my mind to even think about it from another perspective that, hey, you know, what if autism is a symptom, not a diagnosis? And that's, that's what started, you know, um, my journey. Wow, that was very powerful. Um, I would like to go back to the doctor who diagnosed my son with autism 15 years ago and who continues to diagnose children on a daily basis. I get to speak to the parents when they arrive at my organization and the same doctor who 15 years ago walked them out with psychiatric medication is walking them out 15 years later with the same psychiatric medication, no mention of Lyme, no mention of toxin, no mention of mast cell activation, mitochondria, treatments for autism, simply psychiatric medication. So it's wonderful to hear what you're saying today. And yes, receiving that autism diagnosis is extremely traumatic. But what I love about speaking to you, that it is very clear to me and to everyone listening today, that on the day, and I'm actually getting emotional, but on the day that autism picked you, it picked a battle with the wrong person. <laughs> and it's just so inspirational to hear you speaking about autism treatment, 
um, what you have only done for your own son and that your story and the hardship that you and your son endured along your journey should continue to help so many more children and you know it should all be in his merits because um, you were there every step of the way holding holding him up and I have so much admiration for you I really do thank you, thank you. now um, April is World Autism Awareness Month and we're seeing this very steady increase in the autism diagnosis um, I also know that parents, all that the moms want is to hear their child's voice. You'll see I'm actually con combining two questions that I had to ask you, but because I know we're running out of time, but the, the, mom, the moms will say, I just wanted to hear him say, mom, I, I just wanted to hear him call my name. If you've done the diet and you've corrected nutritional deficiency, you've cleaned up the environment, and um, you still don't have vocal speech. What can be done? And what is your message to parents listening today about um, autism and, and really just never giving up for World Autism Awareness Day? Uh, Ilana, the key is to do things in the right order. Looking for possible additional medical issues is important. Uh, many parents usually start with biomedical, I did as well. And when that's of minimal use or not, you know, they don't see a, a big improvement, they explore further. So unfortunately, many aspects may have to be revisited if there are underlying medical issues uh, after those medical issues have been addressed. So in my practice, I'll have, you know, parents that have spent two to three years already, uh, obviously, you know, um, energy resources into treating their child. And then we run some testing and we are like, oh my gosh, look at all of these things going on. So now those have to be addressed first. And we often have to revisit the uh, chelation, the endocrine issues, uh, if, if you are seeing an endocrinologist. And it takes, uh, it takes a while to wean off psychiatric medication, but it is quite possible. I, I, I remember Santino from Sicily that I'm seeing for about a year and a half now. He, his mom, there wasn't, you know, um, Cherie is his mom. And, and she, she tells me, Dr. Deshore, there wasn't a single day when I did not feel guilty for giving these four medications to my son, but they did not have a choice. I wanted him to get an education and, you know, go to school, socialize. And this was the only way that I could give him, you know, any semblance of uh, a so-called normal childhood, you know, uh, and uh, nobody gave me any other options. But now I heard you speak at Autism One. Can you please help me? And we did. It took about seven months, but... Um, you know, and a lot of hard work, as we said before, but Santino is completely off all the four psych meds and he's not young. He's 15 years old. In fact, I think last week I spoke to Sherry, he just turned 16. He's doing really well. It was severe pans for him uh, with mold and, and uh, almost everything else we spoke about today. So, you know, um, so many aspects may have to be revisited once the underlying medical issues have been addressed. So there is no really cookie cutter protocol for speech development. The best we can do is do things correctly, provide the brain with all it needs to repair and regenerate. In my patients, I've seen, uh, let's see, babbling start anywhere from two weeks to two months with some words as well. Phrases about six to 12 months after being on the full protocol. Uh, it varies greatly. Pragmatic language takes a very long time to come in for those who are minimally verbal or nonverbal, but, and it may never come in, right? And when I say pragmatic language, you know, uh, you have to understand that's very advanced. That's like you and I speaking right now, you know, understanding facial expressions, nuances, being able to initiate conversation, knowing when to interject if there are other kids speaking. So that's very advanced. 
Um, but basic language seems to be achievable. Uh, it seems to be achievable. And what I was trying to say is earlier, the better, the younger the child is, that you look at all of the underlying uh, issues, the better. Uh, I remember Grayson now, um, mom is a nurse right here in New Jersey. Uh, in fact, she is going to be uh, a part of my podcast that I'm going to be starting soon. It, it's going to be, you know, patient roundtable, family roundtable, and, and we'll be speaking to um, uh, patients and families uh, about their journey to give people hope. But I, Grayson's mom is going to be on as well. But uh, for Grayson was 22 months when I started with him. And in three months, there's, in, he's lost the diagnosis. This was like, what? <laughs> so, and mom has worked very hard, but in three months, he lost his, uh, his uh, diagnosis. We have some physical issues to work on, you know, because Lyme disease will give you musculoskeletal issues, will give you uh, other kinds of disabilities, which can be worked on, uh, but, uh, the, the big label, the elephant in the room was uh, autism. And that has been reversed already. I, this is obviously clearly an outlier. It's not, it, 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 I've never seen you know, a three month recovery before, but this is what happened with, uh, with Grayson. So you know, it gives a lot of hope. I hope that you will share those podcasts with me so I can also share it with um, our followers on our Facebook group. And then also, it's such an inspirational story. Um, wow, it's profound. It really is. It's life-giving. It's just unbelievable that something like that is possible. And I'm happy that the parents can know that that is possible. Um, if parents want to get in touch with you, we how can they do that? And also where can they find your book? Sure, uh, best is to send a message through my website that is uh, bionexushealth.com. And uh, my book is available worldwide on Amazon. Uh, the beautiful collector's edition that is full color hardcover is only through my, uh, through my website. And we are hoping to introduce the, um, the uh, what is that called? The electronic version of the book PDF on the website in a few months. It's being worked on right now. Thank you, Dr. Dashaw. It's been wonderful speaking to you today. Um, I salute you for all the years that you've done so much good work for so many family, families. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Lana.